So there are the fibrous and cartilaginous joints. We talked about each of their subtypes and where in the human body you might locate some of these joints. That's good. So as you can see in your handout then, we now want to turn our attention to the synovial joints. Let's talk about these. These are going to be more complex than the other two types. Remember, the other two types, you have two bones, and they're locked together with one of the two tissues, either with dense fibrous connective tissue or with a piece of cartilage. There isn't much movement here, um, little or none. And uh, the bones are just held tightly together. In a synovial joint, the bones are given the freedom to move. How do you hold two bones tightly together and yet give them the freedom to move? That is going to be a much trickier thing, much more complex thing. It's going to involve a joint capsule. There's going to be a capsule or a pocket around the ends of the joints that helps hold the bones together. And it's going to involve that capsule holding in a, a fluid, we call it a synovial fluid, that's going to lubricate those surfaces so the bones can move freely. It is going to require that there are some connective tissues around about the joint that are going to lock it together and yet at the same time not restrict it so that it can move in certain ways. So let's talk about the synovial joints. Um, and as I just said, these joints contain a complex set of epithelial and connective tissues that hold the bones together and still allow a range of motion. These joints contain the capsule and the surrounding ligaments, ligaments being bands of connective tissue that are holding the bone together. And that internal capsule um, where the surfaces are lubricated with what we call a synovial fluid. Now within the synovial joints, there are six types of synovial joints. They're listed on your handout and they're listed right here. So let's look at and describe the six types of synovial joints. We know they all have the features we just described in common, but how do they differ? Well, each one is going to differ on the basis of the shapes of the bones where they meet, where they touch. So each ha will have a surface that allows for a certain range of motion. They're all going to diff be different by the placement of the various ligaments that restrict movement. And so we wind up with six synovial joints, each shaped slightly different. So let's describe those shapes and how each one um, can allow the movement that it does. So, six types. Let's first describe the pivot joint. Okay, the pivot joint allows for a movement that we call rotation. Now, we dealt with this, um, we will deal with rotation in uh, the next lecture as we talk about movements, but it's fairly easy to understand here. Um, it's an action where something spins on its axis. It does not move in space. It doesn't move from one location to another. It stays where it is and simply spins or rotates. This requires bone surfaces that will allow one bone to rotate against another. Um, when we actually talk about movements, this one will become a little more apparent. We call this a monoaxial joint because it has one ability of motion. In other words, it just moves in one way. And this bone, this joint, is going to allow for a rotating motion, and that's all. No um, other types of movement 
will take place here typically. Uh, these are fairly rare in the human body. The two places that we would describe them would be in the forearm. And uh, if you just hold your arm out straight in front of you, palm up, notice that without any movement at your elbow, you can rotate your forearm, turning your hand palm down and palm up. So in the forearm, we have a pivot joint. And the other would be at the base of the skull in your neck, which allows your skull um, quite a bit of rotation around the neck, whereas rotation through the rest of your torso takes place with a multitude of cartilaginous joints. So pivot joint, <clears throat> monoaxial, located at the forearm or the neck. Now, second monoaxial joint is the hinge joint. These are fairly common around the body. As I said, these are also monoaxial, just one motion allowed here. And it is a hinging motion, like a door. Um, the door on the classroom here, uh, the door on your bedroom, has got typically several hinges that allow it to swing. And that's all it does. Your door doesn't go up and down. It doesn't go side to side. It doesn't spin around like a, like a revolving door. It simply swings on a hinge. Your knee or your elbow um, would be good examples of this. Your toes or your fingers. Uh, but if you think about your knee particularly, you know that it bends and straightens. That's all it does. It doesn't move side to side. There's no rotation at your knee. The surfaces here are usually wide, and the two surfaces are going to allow a hinging type of action. The other uh, monoaxial joint is the one here at the bottom of the list called the plane joint. This is a joint that is typically described with two flat or semi-flat surfaces that simply slide or glide over one another. Often the movement takes place in several directions, but it's simply one kind of motion, a simple sliding motion. Um, the joints between the tarsals of the foot are a good example of this. Um, you've learned the names of the tarsals by now, and each of them is a short bone or a blocky bone. They don't have a lot of movement here but the bones can slip and slide on one another to allow the foot a certain degree of flexibility to contour it to various surfaces that it might be walking on. So plane joints are flat or semi-flat surfaces. So there are three monoaxial joints in our list. Um, the saddle joint, the third one on your list is considered to be a biaxial joint. And what does this mean? Well, bi like two, like two wheels on a bicycle. The biaxial motion takes place prominently in two directions. Now, if you press this a little bit, you can combine some of those twos and get a greater degree of movement. But the shape of the two bones allows for two prominent motions. And if you look at the shape of the bone here, if you pull those two apart that you see in the picture, you would see that each bone has the shape of a Western riding saddle, the part of the saddle that you would sit on. And two saddles don't fit very well together if they're in the same straight orientation, but if you turn one of the saddles sideways and lay it on the other, they, the two saddles fit very nicely together. And you can see that these bones could slip and slide in two prominent directions. The upper bone could slide side to side, or it could slide forward and back. These joints, the saddle joints, are pretty rare in the human body. The only one that we're going to pay attention to, and it won't be in the lower limb unit, will be the joint at the base of the thumb. The joint 
at the base of the thumb where it anchors into the bones of the wrist is called a saddle joint. And this allows the thumb to do something that the rest of the fingers cannot do. The other fingers simply hinge. They bend forward and back. The thumb, though, is capable of swinging into the palm of the hand and opposing or being used with each of the fingers. Touch with your hand, your thumb, to the to the each of the fingers in your hand. And you can see that. You can touch the tip of your thumb to the tip of each of your fingers. You and I and just several species of apes are the only animals with what we call an opposable thumb. Your cat or your dog has a thumb digit, but it only works like a finger. It just simply hinges. But our thumb makes our hand a tool-using hand. We can use our hand, then, to grasp things effectively between our thumb and our fingers. And all of this is because of the joint there at the base of the thumb that allows it to swing into the palm of your hand and be used with your fingers. So this may be the one joint in the human body that helps make you most human your ability to use tools with that, your hand, and with that joint. So just one location for this saddle joint that we're going to study, and that's at the base of the thumb. Now there is one other biaxial joint, and it's this fourth one in the list, the ellipsoid joint. An ellipse in mathematics is the name that is used for an oval shape, and the ellipsoid joint as you can see, has two bone surfaces that have an oval shape to them. One is concave, one is convex, so they fit into one another, but they allow not only a hinging type action, but the bones can actually slide side to side. Um, there's less range of motion one way or the other, but it is prominently a biaxial joint. You can combine the two motions to get somewhat greater degree of flexibility, but it's primarily biaxial. Uh, a good example of this, I don't like the example in this picture of the base of the skull, but a good example would be at the knuckles of your hand, and this would be true for the joints at the base of your toes, but if you think for a moment about where your fingers join your hand, your, your whole finger can bend forward or back. It can flex or extend at your knuckles at the point where the fingers touch the hand. But they can also do something else. If you hold your hand up, you'll find that you can spread your fingers sideways they can move side to side as well as forward and back. That side to side motion is the second part of that ability at the biaxial joint, at this ellipsoid joint. So um, think about the same thing at your toes, where your toes meet the body of your foot. Not only can you curl your toes or straighten your toes, but you can actually move your toes sideways. So uh, the ellipsoid joint um, allows for this biaxial motion. The last of the joints, the sixth category here, fifth in your list, is the ball and socket joint. The Ball and socket joint is what we call a multi-axial joint. Many movements, many different directions. And here shows the shoulder joint um, in the lower limb. Same thing would be for the hip joint, coxal joint. And the head of the femur fitting into the bone called the acetabulum allows for a very, very large range of motion. So. Good example for us would be the hip. Um, shoulder is good as well, but obviously the ball end of one bone fitting into the socket on the other. 
So there are your six categories, the three monoaxial joints, the pivot hinge and plane, the saddle joint and the ellipsoid that are biaxial, and the ball and socket. Um, make sure that you know these ranges of motion and could give an example of a location for each one of these types. In our next lecture, we'll be talking about movements of the joints and giving you some language to actually describe in more detail what's going on at each of these synovial joints. So, study well.